This is now lecture eight in the series of Logos and the Muse, a journey in mythical history from an Orthodox Christian perspective. So in the previous two lectures, we began to discuss the great medieval synthesis. Now this idea is an all-encompassing idea. It includes cosmology, astronomy, music, even biology. We'll not be discussing all these subjects, however, we're prim primarily focusing on stories and the various forms of high literature, folk tales, and hagiography. So reading and discussing stories that have been handed down to us from our distant ancestors will aid us in understanding our place in the cosmos and universal history. These stories will aid us in forming the moral and spiritual imagination, beautify the soul, and provide us a higher ideal to aim for, to see creation as enchanted. We are modern people shaped by secularism. Because in an Enlightenment project, the world has become denuded of the mythic grandiosity and the glory of God. We've all too often failed to see the world, to use the words of the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, charged with the grandeur of God. So two weeks ago, we discussed the significance of Troy. Last week, the discussion centered on Alexander the Great and King Arthur, knighthood and kingship. Before continuing on to more literature, we need to address the looming question that maybe everyone has in the mind right now, is in the scripture in the early fathers, the gods were demons. In later literature, the gods are often mentioned without any hint of them being demons. And we see this in Chaucer and Dante. And many later poets use them in poetic and figurative senses. So what happened to the gods? In Leviticus 17, 7, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. They shall be a statute for that should be there should be a statute for them forever throughout the generations. Deuteronomy thirty two, sixteen through seventeen. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they have never known, to the new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers have never dreaded. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 10, 20-22. St. Paul tells us, Why do I imply them? What do I imply then? The food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything. No, I imply that what the pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we not stronger than he? In Revelations 2, verse 13, St. John refers to the high altar of Zeus and Pergamum as Satan's throne. And moving out of Scripture into the early fathers, St. Justin Martyr, in his first apology, says pagan mythology has been influenced by wicked demons to deceive and lead the human race astray. St. Irenaeus, in his Against Heresies in Book 3, for the Father of all is called God, and is so. An Antichrist shall be lifted up, and not above him, but above those which are indeed called gods, but are not. And then he references St. Paul's teaching about the gods not being gods, but idols. Also in Book 3, he refers to David stating that the gods of the heathen are, are idols of demons, which is he referencing Psalm 96. So St. John Chrysostom in Homily 20, commenting on 1 Corinthians chapter 8, that no idol is anything in the world, that there is no God but one. What then? Are there no idols, no statues? Indeed there are, but they have no power. There neither are they gods but stones and demons. So who are these demons? So Father Stephen the Young in his book, The Religion of the Apostles, offers a sort of taxonomy of what are normally called demons. There are those whom God assigned to rule over the nations after the Babel event. The archangel Michael was to govern Israel, for example. But one by one, they all fell to corruption and started to accept worship, with the exception of the archangel Michael. So Father Stephen says this, 
2 Peter 2, 4 reads, For God did not pardon the angels when they sinned, but rather threw them into Tartarus and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Here St. Peter makes plain the connection between these wicked angels and the titans of Greco-Roman religion through reference to Tartarus in addition to paralleling the language of First Enoch and other related literature. Referring to Matthew 25.41, Father Stephen says, It is these rebellious angels who are responsible for the spread of sin and the corruption of the world. And this is brought out in Second Temple literature through the identification of their leader. Texts such as First Enoch and the Apocalypse of Abraham identify the leader of these rebellious angels as Azazel. And he's were referring to Christ stating that the devil, the passage, the devil and his angels in Matthew 25, 41. <clears throat> so there are these fallen angel, angels who are governed different parts of creation. Then there are the demons who torment and tempt humans. According to Father Stephen, who draws much from the Second Temple literature, these are demons that are associated with the leader Mastema. So the Book of Jubilees, which was very popular during the first century, but not canonical, but often quoted from by even Jesus himself and the apostles, with this we discussed back in the first lecture. Mastema negotiated with God to allow some of these demons, who are the souls of the dead giants of the Old Testament, to remain in the world to test humanity, which is why they have not been assigned to hell, and why they possess people, because they had a body once, and they seek to have a body again. So we have these demons that are in the fallen angel variety who accepted worship from humanity. These are the ones that scripture and fathers tell us are associated with idol worship, the ones who are fallen angels. So then how do we go from the gods being demons to what we find in the Middle Ages? There's a stage in between where they were perceived as men and tyrants. So also in Satan Justin's first apology, he says the devils put forth certain men who claimed to be gods. So this idea of the gods being men started rather early. You have to keep in mind at this point that they still, the fathers still teach that the gods of the nations have demonic origins. The Clementine homilies, which are part of the pseudo-Clementine literature attributed to St. Clementine of Rome. These are Gnostic texts written in the mid-late 4th century. The reason why I am referring to these here is to show that the variety of this idea um, existed for many traditions. So following a paragraph that calls the stories of the gods lying fables, I quote, <clears throat> They were not gods then, but representations of tyrants. For a certain tomb is shown among the Caucasian mountains, not in heaven but in earth, as that of Kronos, a barbarous man and devourer of children. Further, the tomb of the, the lascivious Zeus, so famed in story, who in like manner devoured his own daughter Metis, is to be seen in Crete and those of Pluto and Poseidon in the Acherusian lake. At all events... The tombs are shown of those that I have named, for they were men, in respect of these things, wicked men and magicians. For else they should not have been, have become despots. I mean Zeus, renowned in history, in, in story, and Dionysus, for that by changing their forms they prevailed over whom they pleased, for whatever purpose they designed. The St. John Damascus in his fount of knowledge, the sec in the second part on heresies, <clears throat> on a section on Hellenism, St. John says this, In those times, everyone was given to superstition, when the races of men had begun to turn to much more civil way of life, to turn also to idolatrous rites and usages. They began to deify men that once walked among them. At first they painted with colors and made pictures of those whom they had once held in esteem, whether tyrants or sorcerers or men, who in their lifetime had done something deemed worthy of note in the line of courage or bodily strength. And further on he said that the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Phrygians, and the Phoenicians were the first to introduce this kind of cult. 
another source, the Prosetta. So in the sixth lecture, I read from the prologue. I read part of that again. Near the earth's center was made the goodly of some homes and haunts that ever have been, which is called Troy, even that which we call Turkland. This abode was much more gloriously made than others, and fashioned with more skill of craftsmanship and manifold wise, both in luxury and the wealth which was there in abundance. There were twelve kingdoms and one high king, and many sovereignties belonged to each kingdom, and the stronghold were twelve chieftains. These chieftains were in every manly part above other men that have ever been in the world. So later, Snorri writes also that Odin and the other gods leave Troy. After its destruction, they travel north. And since they are great men, they are revered as gods, the Asir. He also refers to Troy as Asgard. So we see in multiple traditions here, in different types of literature, spawned over centuries, the idea that the gods were just men, strong men or tyrants. So in Dante and Chaucer and other writers of that period, and also we've seen Renaissance art, such as the famous Botticelli painting, The Birth of Venus, the gods of old are either characters in literature or in um, paintings, or they're a reference often. But once again, why would these gods who are demons but later understood as men or tyrants, influenced by demons, or later simply just men who ruled tyrannically over other men, why would they be used in literature and depicted in art? One more shift had to happen. The gods had to be read allegorically. So many of the fathers, especially the Alexandrians, Origen being the most famous, or maybe infamous, were already employing allegory as interpretive methodology for scripture following after Philo. However, as we get into the Christian age of the empire, some philosophers and grammarians began to use allegory for reading pagan literature. Fabius Planciades and Fulgentius, 5th and 6th century he lived, was known for his outlandish allegorical readings of Virgil. John Zitzes, a late Byzantine grammarian and commentator on Homer, wrote several books containing allegorical readings of the Iliad in Odyssey. He consistently identifies Zeus as destiny and Athena as wisdom. He even considers Hermes, who is a messenger of the gods, to be nothing more than just a letter. He takes a naturalistic approach to such terrifying sea monsters, monsters as Charybdis, that he is just a whirlpool that sailors were killed by. So the shift to the gods is allegory allows later poets to use them as personified types, archetypes, and symbols to interpret for moral and spiritual instruction. Since Christ conquered the demons by the cross, they no longer have any real power. After centuries of their temples converted or destroyed, their cults eradicated, and pagan literature being read through the lens of Christ are merely used just for teaching and learning, grammar of the gods, as demons no longer held sway over the minds of people. Now understood that this centuries-long shift had to happen, or else Dante, Chaucer, Milton, and even Shakespeare would have been wading into murky waters. So I'm going to look at some literature now, seeing this idea of the shift between the ancient and the med med medieval ages. So first we want to look at Beowulf. The Beowulf is an Anglo-Saxon epic written in about 10th to 11th century. The story takes place in a pre-Christian Scandinavia, but it comes to us through a Christian author. Even though the author is anonymous, we know that he is a Christian, and Tolkien defends his belief in a Christian reading of this story. Yet throughout the heroic epic poem, we see remnants of the old pagan world. I quote, Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed, offering to idols swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell, the almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. And this is interspersed between a, many a reference to God being the God of all, the, the one true God, the high God. An example, 
how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdle with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth lamp light, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves, and quickened life and every other thing that moved. In the sixth lecture, I mentioned how many medieval storytellers connected the story and their culture uh, to the past, finding a place in universal history. That was how they wrote mythically, that connection to the, the grand story of mankind. You see this in Beowulf. You don't see the connection, say, to Troy in here, or any of the Trojan heroes, uh, the Greeks, like you see in a lot of other literature. But there is a connection through scripture, which I talked about is another way that a lot of writers connected themselves to the historic, universal historic past. So in Beowulf, the monster Grendel, and therefore also his mother, descended from the line of Cain. I quote, so times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marches, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens he had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters Cain's clan whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts for the killing of Abel the eternal lord had exacted a price Cain not so good with committing that murder because the almighty made him anathema and out of the curse of the exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants too who strove with God time and again until he gave them their final reward. So Tolkien tells us that even though Grendel and his mother are from Cain's lineage within the story, we must not distance them from the Norse monsters. So you begin to see that synthesis taking place. So in Beowulf, we begin to see the working out of this synthesis in several ways. The first in terms of narrative, there are lingering pagan practices which have been mostly replaced and overshadowed by Christianity, but not fully. There's still a pagan society, however, but in the actual poem, paganism is fading and Christianity is rising. Two, the gods are non-existent. The third thing, there exists evil manifesting itself in older forms, but within a shifting socio-religious milieu. We have, on the one hand, monsters from pagan lore, and the other hand, the connection to the biblical narrative. And the fourth and last one, Beowulf as a hero is the best of what the pagan culture had to offer, specifically that culture. He is a pivotal figure, the last of the old world because the old pagan culture has come to an end. So Beowulf needs to be read with this understanding that it is a pivotal epic between two ages of history. The other story I wish to look at briefly is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So there's a 14th century chivalric romance written also anonymously. The same writer is known for other remarkable poems such as Pearl and Cleanness. It features King Arthur. So it's part of the Arthurian uh, cycle, but it's not, it's more on the, the periphery. It's kind of almost like the equivalent of um, you know, books and texts that we don't consider fully canonical, but we still read them for their benefit. <clears throat> so I will, I read some from this a couple weeks ago, the opening part about Troy. So I'm going to read where I left off and kind of skip around a little bit to kind of get a feel for what's happening here. So this king lay at Camelot at Christmas tide. Many good knights and gay his guests were there. Arrayed at the round table of rightful brothers with feasting and fellowship and carefree mirth. There are true men contended in tournaments. Many joined there in jousting these gentle knights and came to the court of for carol dancing. For the feast was in force full fifteen days with all the meat and the mirth that men could devise. Such gaiety and glee glorious to hear. Brave din by day, dancing by night. High were their hearts and halls and chambers, these lords and these ladies. For life was sweet. In peerless pleasures passed they their days, the most noble knights known under Christ, and the loveliest ladies that lived on earth ever. And he, the comeliest king that the court holds, 
For all this fair folk in their first age were still happiest of all mortal kind, King Nobles fame of will, you would now go to find so hardy a host on hill. And of course, the king they're referring to here is King Arthur. Skipping ahead a little bit in the story, the Green Knight enters. There hurdles in at the hall door an unknown rider, one of the greatest on ground in growth of his frame, from broad-necked buttocks so bulky and thick, and his loins and his legs so long and so great, half a giant on earth I hold him to be, but believe him no less than the largest of men, and that the seamless in his statue to see as he rides for in back and at breast, though his body was grim, his waist and his width was worthily small, and formed with every feature in fair accord was he. Great wonder grew in hall, as his hue most strange to see, from man and gear and all were green, as green could be. And in guise all green, and the gear and man, a coat cut close that clung to his sides, and a mantle to match made with a, lint, with a lining, a fur's cut and fitted, the fabric was noble and embellished, all with ermine in his hood beside that was loose from his locks, and laid on his shoulders with trim hose and tight, the same tint of green, his great calves were girt and gold spurs under, he bore on silk bands that embellished his heels, foot gear well fashioned for riding most fit, and all his vesture verily was verdant green. Both the bosses in his belt and other bright gems, they were richly ranged on uh, his raiment noble, about himself and his saddle set upon silk, that to tell half the trifles would tax my wits, the butterflies and birds embroidered thereon, and green of the gayest with many a gold thread, the pendants of the breast band, the pricely crupper, and the bars of the bit were brightly, brightly enameled, the stout stirrups were green, the steadied his feet, and the bows of the saddle and the side panels both, that gleamed all and glinted with green gems about the steed he bestrides of that same green so bright, a green horse, great and thick, a headstrong steed of might, embroidered bridle quick, mount march man aright. So there's a lot of green, which is important here. But I'm going to back up a little bit right before the green knight enters. So the yearly cycle is important here. We read that it is Christmas time. The days are cold and dark. The new year is on the horizon, but it's not quite come into the field of vision. So this marks the end of something and the beginning of something else. So the green man, or the green knight, is likely best understood in terms of the Celtic green man. Green Man is an ancient primordial figure covered in foliage, often associated with growth, rebirth, and nature. It is odd because these symbols or figures typically represent spring and not winter. So winter is best understood as a period of nature waiting in her grave, not fresh growth. So something is going on here, and the poet is telling us something. It is Christmas time, and the new year awaits. Green Man, being a remnant of the old pagan world, steps into the festivities and offers a challenge. So in Sir Gawain, we begin to see the working out of the synthesis in a few ways. Once again, the connection of Troy in the opening uh, few several stanzas, and actually the, the epic closes also with the mention of Troy. So we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Two, we see this connection, there are no longer uh, any pag lingering pagan deities. They're completely gone. Unlike in Beowulf, you see some lingering, lingering pagan practices. And the third thing is the old world is fading, and the new world, centered on the incarnation, which is what Christmas is all about, is dawning. And the Christian age has come. But there are cultural residues and sort of remnants of the old world that either have to die be integrated within the Christian tradition. Now this last point is one that is one of the, the main themes and threads running throughout the entire study of mythic history. That there are parts of the old world that either get 
either have to be done away with and the church discards, or it becomes baptized and renewed and integrated within the Christian faith. And we see this mostly in storytelling. So what of these remnants, though, that do get integrated? Some people think this is a bad thing, but ultimately this should be perfectly fine because did not Christ assume humanity and heal it? Has not the church been baptizing pagan, the pagan world for centuries? Yes, much has been weeded out, but the viable seeds, the verdant growth, the good fruit has been preserved by the church. So the Gawain poem needs to be read within the context of the Arthurian legends, even though it's not one of the main stories in that cycle, that the themes of last week, knighthood and kingship and chivalry come to the fore within this, within this heroic poem. And because of the content of this story, it should be read in terms of dying paganism that would be baptized into the Christian story. So we've covered a lot of ground today. We saw that the early church knew that the gods were really demons. And later a shift began to happen to believe that the gods should be merely great men or tyrants. And some stating that they were influenced by demons. Some saying they were just tyrannical, strong men. By the Middle Ages, an established tradition of reading the gods allegorically became the preferred method. So this allowed the poetic use of the gods as personifications of wisdom, destiny, um, etc., love, even, reason, to become the dominant way of reading. <clears throat> so the best way to really get a feel for the, how this transition happens is to read, really to read Beowulf, which is a very old story, and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. They offer a narrative way of seeing how this shift plays out, now, great storytellers understood this process from within their own cultures. So next week, we'll continue our discussion in the medieval synthesis, and we will look to the High Ages. The High Middle Ages, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs>